Hey there, cats and giddies. I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and with this video, we discuss my thoughts on Season 2, Episode 12 of The Orville, entitled Sanctuary. And uh, this was just a spectacular episode. <laughs> Two spectacular Star Trek-like episodes in a row tonight, Star Trek Discovery and The Orville, respectively. Both were balls-to-the-wall awesome sauce. And uh, this one, you know, it's not least of which because in the early going of this episode, I was highly, highly afraid that everything was going to play out predictably with the, the title Sanctuary and this Mocklin couple having snuck aboard the Orville, a female child, a female infant, um, which was what I suspected was going to be the case. I, I figured they had probably snuck aboard a child and I had thought with the title Sanctuary, they were going to be seeking asylum and, and there was going to be this risk of uh, a fallout with, you know, the Mocklin homeworld proper that they were going to try to get them back and, and, you know, trying to grant them asylum was going to be the grand debate. And it went that much deeper, that much further than I ever could have predicted or assumed <laughs> going into it with this hidden sort of offshoot world in, in the heart of a nebula with all of these Mocklin females, all these Mocklin women for years. Um, <laughs> they've, they've had sort of an underground railroad sneaking off these female infants born to the Mocklin society in order to save them and preserve their lives and, and the sanctity of, of that right to live as they were born. And it just, it was mind blowing. <laughs> they keep going back to this Mocklin well, and I'm telling you every single Mocklin, you know, sort of, sort of focused upon episode plot has me at the edge of my seat. Um, I, I'm sure much as <laughs> with the rest of the Orville fandom, you know, gritting my teeth just at the edge of my seat, like what, what is going to happen and, and wishing almost to be able to just browbeat every Mocklin male in existence, <laughs> you know? Um, and we had a spectacular Star Trek alumnus cast in this episode from Marina Sirtis, who had a somewhat understated, uh, you know, uh, appearance as the teacher for, you know, Topa and everything like that, um, on board the Orville. F. Murray Abraham from Star Trek uh, Insurrection, which is my sister's all-time favorite next-gen Trek movie. Um, we went and saw it together on her birthday, the year it came out, and uh, that had been like a yearly tradition, going and seeing all the next-gen movies when they were coming out. Uh, she hasn't watched the Orville yet, hasn't given it a proper sit-down, um, but she's always listening to my telling her about the episodes and everything like that. <laughs> She was kind of grinning when I said, hey, the dude from Insurrection is in this one, and so is Marina Sirtis, you know, <laughs> whatever like that. Uh, Tony Todd. Tony Todd, who played Worf's brother, um, he was in here as well, the main sort of uh, Mocklin antagonist, if I'm correct. Couldn't quite tell wholeheartedly with the makeup that he had on, but that voice, that booming voice, and, and just... The performances, man, having all of the admirals that we've seen since the beginning of season one in one room together shows you just how on the precipice this whole debate is, this Grand Planetary Union debate is. And that was mind-blowing, uh, going to this, you know, sort of Planetary Union hall with all of these different Planetary Union members. It was mind-blowing. Um, the whole thing had shades of Star Trek familiar visuals and, and aesthetics, uh, you know, that kind of thing, uh, especially feature film aesthetics from the, the trial when Kirk and Spock and McCoy, Uhura, Sulu, Chekhov, when they're all on trial at the end of Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, that's very much what this hall felt like, a sort of a, a, not a courtroom necessarily, but all of these Union worlds were involved, much as they were at the end of Star Trek IV, to oversee what the judgment call was going to be, whether whether Kirk and his crew would be, uh, you know, penalized for having, <laughs> as it were, stolen the Enterprise in Star Trek III, the search for Spock, and uh, but then subsequently saving, you know, the world, saving uh, the United Federation of Planets from destruction and whatever. And so they were like, we're just going to give you a slap on the wrist, Kirk. You're, you're no longer an admiral. You're a captain. Here's your ship back. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and, and very similarly so, Insurrection. Insurrection the visuals of, of the Mocklin males going down to this planet and trying to take custody of all these Mocklin females and everything like that, um, it, it was an unfolding insurrection almost. <laughs> you know, were it not for Kelly and were it not for Tala and everything like that, to, to be sort of a, the, the get-in-between, you know, to, to stop them and halt that process, 
all hell would have broke loose. I mean, all hell was breaking loose. We, we had Gordon flying the ship like just a master stroke all through that nebula. It was beautiful, I thought, uh, all the visuals of that and everything. Um, although it was a, it, it's always a little weird to see such a, a hulking space vessel, space vehicle, making all of these uh, fast moves and twists around and everything. <laughs> like that um i don't i don't know if that's how a space vehicle would necessarily be able to move in space i, I guess it, it would be achievable to a certain degree um everything was just spectacular the plot being reunited with uh, uh i forget her name but the elder uh Mocklin woman and <laughs> the whole thing i'm usually the guy who gripes on the contemporary humor in this show um saying that it, it always takes me out of it and things like that but uh dolly parton's nine to five baby I like the song. I, I'm not really a country fan. Um, I always liked the movie. I liked the song. And, and that song became an integral factor <laughs> in, in this female Mocklin-led rebellion. And, and I loved that. <laughs> I loved when it comes to it in the end when the other leg drops and she, she gets up <laughs> in Mercer's face and she's like, do you think Dolly Parton, were she alive today, would have been proud of what we achieved? <laughs> and just that ear to ear grin. Yes, yes, she would have. Uh, you know, the fact that they're making a 9 to 5 sequel, <laughs> which was only just recently <laughs> announced in the last several months. Um, it's Maybe it's coincidence, maybe not. Maybe it's Seth MacFarlane putting out his fandom for Dolly Parton and this song and that movie and whatever like that. Um, that musical flavor always comes back, always rears its head in... <laughs> in this show and sometimes I could take it or leave it usually I call it out if it's something that I, I wasn't that pleased with or whatever like that or if it took me out of the episode but no in this particular case I started grinning as soon as I heard the song and and kind of seeing where it was going and then how it was utilized in her speech amongst that planetary union auditorium that hall um it just was like I didn't get goosebumps necessarily but I was like Oh, hell yes. <laughs> I see what you're doing here, man. And I dig. Um, and what's more, it, it could only, you know, that was all the icing on the cake of, of a very sweet confectionery cake to begin with of a plot. But then you have the cherry on top with Bordas going and visiting the classroom one final time and now seeing his son commiserating and, and commingling with the female student, you know, um, his smile it's just like I welled up with tears and I'm even kind of sort of welling up with tears a little bit recounting it now um because that's that's what I want for our world that's the perfect world I wish we all lived in where people could just be who they are the way they were born and be left to live their lives you know um that very humanitarian aesthetic this could have been the season finale, and, and I would have been singing its praises. Uh, we're told via the preview for the next episode that there's going to be an intruder aboard, and it's the penultimate episode of the season, so there's two episodes left, if I'm to take what they're saying uh, literally. And But this, this could have been it. This could have been the finale of the season. I know we still have overhanging concerns, like the Kalons and like the Krill, and whether, whether we're going to have a you know, sort of tepid alliance with the Krill or not because of the threat the Kalons represent. I don't know if any of these things are going to be answered by the end of the season, and uh, I'm still waiting to hear season three confirmation. They better give it to us. Uh, if they know <laughs> what's good for them, they better give it to us. They better give us a season three of this show um, because when it is done right, it is just done so, so grandiously, so great. Um... And, and this episode is, it's, it's like probably my favorite of the season. Arguably, it's maybe the best of the season. Um, even above the Kalon 2 parter, <laughs> you know, at this point. Which, un, until now, was my favorite of the season. Was my, my uh, you know, pick for best of the season. No, I think this one outdoes it. <laughs> and, and then some. Um, this is what I want from my entertainment. I want, you know, not something that is getting up in your face and preaching it out to you, but something that, that harkens back to that idea that should be ingrained in all of us and should be celebrated in all of us, that we are all the same, we're all equal, and, and no matter our persuasion, our gender, our, our race, you know, all of these things, the, the grandest, most exalted elements of Star Trek proper 
as envisioned by Gene Roddenberry. They were full display, full mast in this episode of The Orville. And I commend Seth MacFarlane. I commend the writers, the actors, the performers, everyone involved with this show. This could have been the last episode of this show ever. And it would have went out on such a high note, such a high tier, you know, per my own personal tastes, uh, <laughs> at my own estimation. This, this just, it was the best. It was simply the best. And uh, my accolades and my applause to everyone involved in it for just a, a grand hour of entertainment. Uh, or 42, 45 minutes <laughs> without commercials. And so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below what you thought of episode 12 of season 2 of The Orville. If you've seen it as well, love it or hate it, anything goes in the comments below. As long as you are respectable, sharing your own opinion, and are respectful of others. And uh, if you enjoyed this video and would like to consider supporting my channel, please have a look at my PayPal support link posted both in the description as well as the comments below, which affords you opportunities to look into very much akin to Patreon, where you can set up a monthly contribution, a one-time only kind of thing, send me a personal message alongside any contribution you send my way, requesting topics I may discuss in the future, ask for shout outs, make recommendations of things I may check out and shout you out down the line if I happen to talk about them, and uh, all that good stuff, you know, and anything you saw fit to send my way would be two thumbs up for me and would secure my longevity on YouTube for the foreseeable future, and it would just be very much appreciated if you took the time. And uh, so yeah, otherwise it'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well, and I'll catch you all later. Peace.